I'm pleased to announce our, our first speaker uh, for this year's uh, renamed Path Presents. It's the, it was a bit of an anachronism, so we, I, I changed it to Research and Discovery, or R&D. Uh, but the focus is still the same. And, and so our inaugural speaker is, is Dr. Jessica Young, who is an associate professor in our very own uh, DLMP, uh, where she has been here since 2016. I think we started pretty much the same time. Uh, prior to that, uh, she was at UCSD uh, in Larry Goldstein's lab, where she was doing some really cool work in Alzheimer's disease. And I guess that's why you got the interest, the bug for Alzheimer's disease. And, and she has continued on uh, and has done a bunch of cool work uh, and has you know, gotten a lot of grants and papers. Uh, and uh, we're really looking forward to hearing what you have to tell us about uh, the, since the last time you gave this talk. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully there's a pretty good update in here. Um, thank you. Okay, I will go ahead and share my screen and um, do the ask real quick that everyone can see it in the correct orientation. Correct. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's great to be here. As Scott said, I last gave this seminar in 2016, just a few months after I started my lab. Um, here and so it's really exciting to be giving it again six years later um, and uh, also with our new departments uh, of pathology our laboratory medicine and pathology now. So uh, the title of my talk uh, in this lysosomal dysfunction is a therapeutic as a therapeutic for Alzheimer's disease insights from um, human induced pluripotent stem cell molecules. So my lab is also part of the Institute for Stem Cell and Regener Regenerative Medicine and we focus primarily on using IPS-based models. So just as a brief introduction, I think as with any other organ, we all know that the adult human brain is very complex and this makes it susceptible to damage or degeneration. And the most common neurodegenerative disease, as I'm sure most of you know, is Alzheimer's disease. It affects nearly um, every area of the brain um, by the time it's advanced. And again, as most of you know, this risk dramatically increases with age and therapeutic options are limited and even controversial. So just to point out some headlines, last year Biogen came out with a drug that caused a lot of controversy. And then if you read the Seattle Times or the New York Times or anything today, you know that they've just put out another drug um, that looks promising in a major trial, although we all know that news headlines often are not quite the same as what happens when something has undergone rigorous peer review, which is uh, currently happening um, right now with the, this newest compound. Um, so the goal in my lab really, uh, since my postdoc has been the things I got interested in in my postdoc and have carried on into my lab is to understand really cellular patho mechanisms of Alzheimer's disease in order to inform novel therapeutic development. Because thus far, really all of these approved therapies have focused on removal of end stage pathology. And so I'm talking about the removal of the amyloid beta, the component of the senile plaque, which accumulates outside of the cells and um, phosphorylated tau, which is a component of something called a neurofibrillary tangle. And that occurs inside the cells and the, um, presence of A-beta plaques and uh, phosphorylated tau neurofibrillary tangles are really the two pathological hallmarks of AD, but the strategies to remove these, um, at, especially at late stages, have generally been unsuccessful. And what we know from genetics is that this points to, there's, there's multiple cellular pathways that can be involved in Alzheimer's disease. So whether um, a human harbors rare mutations that can be considered causative for Alzheimer's disease, or they harbor um, more common variants uh, that have a a less of an effect size, how these cellular pathways are affected by these variants or mutations is still an area of great study. And they involve many, many pathways that um, affect different components of the cell. Of course, they're not all mutually exclusive. So out of all of this list of um, it involved cellular pathways, I'm gonna to talk to you today about endosomal trafficking. 
And so let me briefly introduce our model system. I think all of you know by now about human-induced pluripotent stem cells, where we can take a somatic cell from an individual, um, a living, or actually we can do it from postmortem tissue. I'll talk about that at the end. We can reprogram these to a stem cell. The ability of the cell can become any uh, cell type or tissue type of the body. And our lab uses protocols to differentiate these into neural cell types. And currently, we have um, several different cell types we're working on. The two that we do the most commonly are a differentiation step to cortical neurons and a differentiation step to microglia. So microglia are the innate uh, immune cells of the central nervous system. And you can, you'll can um, notice both from genetics and some of the studies we talk about today, their neuroimmune functions are extremely important in um, how Alzheimer's disease uh, begins and its uh, progression. So of course, with every model, there's advantages and disadvantages. I'm just going to highlight the, what I consider the advantages of the IPS model here is that we can actually do experiments in living uh, central nervous system cells, which is hard to do from humans. We can capture the unique uh, human genetics and we can look at things that are not representing the end stage of a, a very long and progressive disease. So um, to give you an outline of what I wanna talk about today, I'll first go through a little bit of a background and our general hypotheses on why we're focusing on the endolysosomal network. And the bulk of it will be really showing you studies we've done in the lab that have dissected the role of this AD risk gene, SORL1, and in endolysosomal functions using both uh, human neurons and microglia. And at the end, I wanna briefly talk about some ongoing experiments that are directly related to AD patients and um, some preclinical studies. So just to uh, reiterate, we know that this canonical pathology defines Alzheimer's disease at autopsy. This is the uh, accumulation of A-beta plaques and tau tangles, but these, um, Structures within the cell that we now call endosomal traffic jams may represent an early pathology. So studies from decades ago saw these enlarged endosomal structures in um, brains from patients diagnosed just with mild cognitive impairment, so prior to a full-blown diagnosis of AD. And more than two decades later, the same group is really implicating um, dysfunction in autophagosomes and lysosomes as being present in neurons prior to the accumulation of A-beta plaque in uh, transgenic mouse models. And if we think about the cell biology, the molecules that are really integral to the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease um, are trafficked through the endolysosomal network. And so the main example I'm going to give you here is with this uh, molecule called APP. APP is the precursor protein that is cleaved to form amyloid beta, which composes these plaques. And the normal biology of APP is its secretion um, out of the Golgi to the plasma membrane, where it can be cleaved in a non-amyloidogenic manner. And then it, after APP is re-endocytosed and sequ is sequestered in something called the early endosome, is when it can be cleaved by enzymes to generate A beta. And then, of course, it can go through various pathways within the cell. And as I showed you in the beginning, now with the um, advent of genome-wide association studies, more and more endocytic genes are being implicated in increased AD risk. So the overarching hypothesis that we've been working on is that genetic variation in endosomal network uh, genes is a molecular driver of AD pathogenesis. And we think that using iPSCs, we can capture this uniqueness of human genetics and understand the cell biology because this process is essential for cells for many reasons, two of which I've listed here. It really regulates the intracellular locations of where proteins are. This is highly important for specialized cells, such as neurons, which need to um, have proteins such as synaptic proteins in specific places. And it's essential for homeostasis in, and cell physiology in all cell types. But each of these cell types may utilize different um, genes and um, pathways within this uh, cellular network differently. And that's also important to recognize as the 
the cells that are involved in Alzheimer's disease are more than just neurons. They also involve glia and to some extent vascular cells. So as we're trying to understand this pathway and develop potentially new treatments to um, affect its function, it's important to understand what happens if, it ha if these processes happen in differently in different cell types. And so again, we can do this using iPS cells. Okay, so our project is really investigating these phenotypes that are attributed to this AD risk gene SORL1, which codes for a protein called SORLA. And recently, um, there's been a lot of studies that have implicated SORLA in sort of two different ways. So this gene harbors rare variants. These are frame shift um, causing premature stop codons or missense um, variants that are protein coding changes that are very rare, but considered very high risk for AD, up here with genes um, that we consider causative, presenolins 1, 2, and APP. Sorla also harbors common variants. So these are often non-coding variants. They've been identified by GWAS that on their own may have a very low effect on AD risk, but could be considered along with other common variants in polygenic risk. And this protein, SORLA, is an endosomal receptor, and it mediates trafficking from the early endosome. It's part of a mammalian family of receptors called the BPS10 domain receptors. There's five of them in mammals. The SORLA is a little different. It's much larger, and it has extra domains that may facilitate unique protein-protein interactions. And where it really resides is this little blue cartoon here is SORLA, and the yellow here is APP is it resides really at this, um, the hub of, what it, the, of the early endosome. So as cargo comes into the cell, it goes into this sorting station called the early endosome, and then it can be trafficked via multiple pathways and SORLA helps cargo or proteins do that. So there's a few key points. Um, this is a very complex pathway, but there's just a few key points I'd like you to sort of remember throughout this talk that sorting um, this process involves a multi-protein complex called retromer, here shown in red. This diagram shows it going to the Golgi. We now know that retromer, uh, this protein complex, can facilitate traffic to the lysosome and to the cell surface as well. And one very important cargo uh, for SORLA is APP. And the levels of SORLA expression inversely impact how much A-beta is generated because when SORLA is present in the cells, it prevents APP from being cleaved to A-beta. But we really think that there is a much larger role um, for, this, for this protein. And to give you a little bit of background, so for a long time, expression changes in SORL1 have been documented in AD brains. Usually um, people show that SORLA expression is lost. And I started getting interested in this gene when I was a postdoc um, in UC San Diego in Larry Goldstein's lab, where we generated iPS cells from patients that were diagnosed with um, probable sporadic AD or controls. So these, these patients did not have any causative mutations for AD, but they did have common variants in SORL1. And we could group these variants that formed certain haplotypes um, as protective, meaning by GWAS, they were associated with decreased AD risk or a risk um, alleles, showing by GWAS they were associated with increased AD risk. And to just summarize our findings, what we saw is that we could induce, when we um, differentiated neurons from these stem cells, we could induce SORL1 expression by a factor called brain-derived neurotrophin factor, a very important signaling molecule in the brain. However, everybody who had one copy of a risk allele, was their, their cells were unable to increase SORL1 expression after BDNF treatment. And what this did was impact A-beta projection. So BDNF treatment could reduce A-beta in responsive cells, but not in um, risk allele carrying cells. And what was interesting is that these phenotypes correlated with patient genotype, not necessarily whether they were uh, diagnosed with a probable um, AD. The second background I want to introduce here is a uh, work that was actually finished here at the University of Washington. <clears throat> so we took the same set of cell lines and we showed that a small molecule that stabilizes retromer, remember that protein complex I introduced to you a little, a uh, few slides ago, 
that interacts with SORL1, we, we put a small molecule on cells that stabilized retromer and we saw a reduction in both A-beta peptides and phosphorylated tau, these two sort of neuropathological uh, phenotypes. What was really interesting at the time was that we made a cell line where we genetically knocked out the amyloid precursor protein, so these cells have no amyloid beta, and we could still show a reduction in phosphorylated tau. So what that showed us is that the molecules that impact this pathway can modulate amyloid, but the pathway is not dependent on amyloid. And what was really exciting at the time and something that we've continued to work on is that we, we thought that there was then really a potential for this pathway to be a therapeutic target. Okay, so what I wanna do now is talk to you a little bit about some of the work that we've done in my lab to really dissect the role and the cell type specific role of this AD risk gene um, SORL1. So what we've done is we've genetically manipulated um, SORL1 expression using iPS cells. We've done this with gene editing of CRISPR-Cas9, where we've generated an isogenic series where we have fully deficient SORL1 knockout or haploinsufficient cells that have at least one copy of SORL1, but loss on the second allele. And we've also generated a series of disease-linked variants. And we have a cell line where we were able to um, overexpress the SORLA cDNA. And what's really important as I talk about these studies is they're all done in the same genetic background. And then we have we do this in iPS cells, and then we can differentiate neurons and microglia, and we've measured A beta secretion, we've measured endosome and lysosome size, cellular localization of cargo and cell surface recycling. And in microglia, we've looked um, at organelle size, phagocytosis, and degradation of A-beta, and also cytokine expression. So what we first showed a couple of years ago now that simply knocking out SORLA in neurons leads to endosome pathology. So we saw these enlarged endosomal structures, very um, similar to what had been seen in um, early AD neurons. So this suggested, this was our first clue that knocking out this gene was causing some kind of dysfunction in this pathway. And as we expected, we also saw an increase in um, amyloid beta peptides. So what we wanted to understand then was, this, was the, whether or not there was a connection. So does the increased A beta that we're seeing lead to enlarged endosomes, or is it this, sort of traffic jam hypothesis that this enlarged endosome is causing stress on the other um, components of the network causing, and that's what's driving the mislocalization and processing of APP. So we, we reduced um, A beta levels in neurons with an uh, inhibitor of an enzyme called beta secretase. And I'm gonna try to point to this. Um, so this is a very simple schematic of APP APP undergoes multiple cleavages to make a beta. One of the cleavages is at the beta secretase site. And if you put a, an inhibitor of that enzyme in, you will not get cleavage and you will not get a beta. So we treated our cells with that. And you can see down here on the bottom, we were able to reduce a beta in our SORL1 knockout cells compared to vehicle, but we did not rescue endosome size. So we concluded that these enlarged endosomes we think that are causing traffic jams are A beta independent. So we then went on to really try to understand what else is happening in the cells where they may have these traffic jams. And the first thing we did was look at localization of important cargo in neurons that may be impacted if this sorting process isn't happening correctly. So here we did uh, staining studies where we looked at three neuronal cargo, APP, a, a molecule called TRAC-B, this is the receptor for a neur the neurotrophin BDNF, and a molecule called GLUA1, which is a subunit of a synaptic complex called AMPA receptors. And we co-stained these for an early endosome marker called EEA1, so that's what this is. And basically what we found is that for all of these cargo, we have an accumulation of them in the early endosome. And data I'm not showing you here is that when we look at other organelles, there was less of this cargo in them. So it really seemed to us that these cargo were getting stuck in these enlarged early endosomes. So 
how would that impact neuronal function and contribute to neuronal degradation? So I'm going to throw this pathway slide at you again. As I highlighted in the beginning, we really consider the early endosome as a, as a hub for um, molecules coming into the cell and then getting to where they need to go. And some of these places could be the lysosome. So this could impact protein degradation and proteostasis within the cell. And the other pathway um, that we looked at is that it could affect recycling. So how things go from this endosome back to the cell surface, which in neurons is extremely important for proper synaptic function and neurotrophic signaling. So we did several assays to test these pathways. So I'm going to go through the assays here and then show you the data. So we looked at lysosomal degradation. The way we do that is by feeding the cells a molecule called DQ red BSA. And when it's um, all attached together, when we feed it to the cells, it gets into the cell. It does not fluoresce until it gets to a compartment where it has a high pH. And the high pH of these um, lysosomes cleaves the bonds and unquenches the fluorophore. So you have more fluorescence as this molecule gets to an acidic compartment. And what we saw in our knockout cells is a lower DQ red BSA signal suggesting that at two time points, there was less um, of this molecule getting to the lysosome. We wanted to look at the cell surface recycling pathway. So again, we used a fluorescence-based assay. This is called transferrin recycling. Um, transferrin is a molecule that is into cytose and then recycled out of the cell over time. And you can again attach a fluorophore to it and measure the rate of how, of how this molecule gets out of the cell. So in this case, the higher signal that we observed in our knockout cells is an indication of dysfunction in recycling because there's more transferrin into the cell and it's not getting recycled out. So here we saw dysfunction, both of substrates getting into the lysosome or getting out of the cell to be recycled. More specifically, we wanted to look at lo the localization further of the subunit of the AMPA receptor, blue A1. So remember I told you this is a, an important component for um, the neural synapse, the neuronal synapse, so this must be on the cell surface to function properly. So it got stuck in early endosomes, as I showed you a couple of slides ago. And so we did specific staining for levels of this on the cell surface, on the neuronal surface. And we saw decreased levels of this receptor on the cell surface, all of which indicate that it is not being um, properly recycled. We did bulk RNA sequencing of our cells, and this not only confirmed that we uh, we were probably observing alterations in trafficking pathways, but can also give us further insights into functional consequences. So it was really interesting is that our top-down regulated genes really indicated pathways that involve molecules needing to go to the cell surface, be endo endocytosed and recycled, such as receptors and ligands. So we first saw major alterations in beta integrins, again, molecules that are endocytosed and recycled out that function in axon form formation and guidance. We saw changes in efferins and efferin receptors. These are important synaptic components. And we saw changes in um, growth factor. This is nerve growth factor and nerve growth factor signaling. What was really interesting is that our top upregulated genes were all genes that were involved in ion-gated uh, channels, which is also important for neuronal function. And so we tested this further by putting our neurons on a device called a multi-electrode array. And what this does is that as neurons are starting to form action potentials, it measures the, um, the, the degree of the activity of the neuron. And what we could see is that early on, we actually saw these cells were being hyped hyper excitable, that they had a higher uh, um, firing rate. But as they continued to differentiate and mature, this rate decreased compared to their wild type counterparts. So we're still, try still trying to understand this a little better. This is looking at individual neurons. This data is not really recapitulating a um, synchronized synaptic network where one cell fires to the other and, and talks to the other. So a postdoc in the lab, Andy Williams, is working on, on doing those studies now. And very preliminary data is showing that when you have a wild type cell, you start to see the synchronous bursting of uh, action potentials that are happening um, 
within the culture. This is a, called a network burst, and it really it does indicate a functioning synaptic network. And we do seem to have deficiencies of this in our knockout cells. So we wanted to ask whether enhancing SORL1 expression then could improve trafficking in any of these phenotypes, as we always in the back of our mind are wondering whether or not this is a um, valid therapeutic pathway. And I'll bring this up again later. SORL1 is very big. It's too, it's a very large gene. It's too big to put in a standard lentiviral vector and, and express that way. So we use um, a piggyback method to insert the cDNA into our cell lines. And just really quickly, um, we were happy to see that when we overexpress SORL1, we mainly see the opposite of what we see when it's knocked out. We have a reduction in amyloid peptides. We have increased trafficking of substrates to the lysosome, and we have increased um, trafficking of substrates through the recycling pathway. Primarily, we have uh, much higher levels of the glutamate receptor subunit on the cell surface. Okay, so that was what was happening in neurons. So then we started to look at microglia, and what we saw was pretty interesting. So it turns out that this traffic jam at the early endosome seems to be specific in neurons. We have differentiated microglia from the same IPS uh, culture, and we do not see the enlarged endo endosome phenotype in microglia. What's happening is that we think in microglia, this loss of SORL1 seems to really converge at the level of the lysosome. So here we see um, enlarged lysosome puncta and also fewer um, numbers of lysosomes. So they're either getting enlarged or they're fusing together. We haven't quite uh, figured that out yet. Um, either case would be ind indicative of sort of dysfunction in this degradative pathway. When we do our DQ BSA assay, again, this time we did it by flow cytometry and looked over time, we can see, again, we have a deficiency in um, lysosomal degra degradation of substrates in our knockout cells. And this really does impact the neuroimmune functions of microglia. So microglia are the, the immune cells of the CNS. They phagocytose substrates. They secrete cytokines. They mount an immune response. And so we could look at phagocytosis by conjugating um, the amyloid beta peptide, which is a, a common phagocytic substrate of microglia, to a pH-sensitive dye called Frodo. And this works kind of similarly to the, to the um, DQ BS, red BSA assay in that this dye fluoresces more strongly in an acidic compartment like a lysosome. So again, we can sort of do a, a pulse chase assay and pulse the cells with Frodo and look at it over time. So again, we see a, um, a decrease in the amount of the substrate that's um, getting to an acidic compartment. And current work that we're doing now is to test whether we are having the, this um, impairment at the level of taking up the amyloid beta or actually trafficking it to the lysosome. But interestingly, this does seem to impair um, cytokine release. So we can stimulate the mitochondria with a classical stimulus, LPS, or a, a pro-inflammatory stimulus, interferon gamma, and um, run the media and look at different cytokines. So we can see pretty much across the board that our SORL1 knockout cells, when stimulated, have a blunted um, cytokine release. And very preliminary data suggests that if we take our overexpressing cells and make microglia, we can improve some of these phenotypes. So here you see our um, lysosomal degradation via DQ red BSA is improved in the microglia. And it looks like the phagocytosis is being improved at least at some time points. These are um, currently ongoing experiments that Swati Mishra, who's a postdoc in the lab, is um, working on right now. Okay, so now I wanna talk a little bit more about experiments that we are considering possibly more related to AD patients. So everything I've talked to you about has been in the context of a SORL1 knockout, which is really important for genetics. You know, genetics, it's an important genetic model to do these in vitro studies. 
but it's not altogether disease relevant because we don't really know of patients that have a full loss of sorrel one. Most um, sorrel one variants or uh, that are pathogenic are heterozygous. And so I'm gonna go through a little bit of how we're trying to look at that now. So, you know, this is a busy slide, but I'll just walk you through it a little bit. Um, this is a figure that shows all of the variants that have been identified in sorrel one, at least of a, as of 2017. And this is bigger now. There's over 500 variants in this large gene. The red um, indicates things, uh, variants that are only found in AD cases. The green indicates variants that are found in controls. And the circles indicate missense variants and the stars uh, uh, indicate truncating variants. So there's a, just a few things I wanna highlight. Everything that is a truncating variant in SORL1 are always in AD cases. So we can con consider that loss of at least one copy of SORL1 is a very, very high risk of developing AD. Also, a large number of the missense variants found only in AD cases are in this BPS10 domain of the protein. And so what we went on to do is use CRISPR to generate, uh, again, a series of cell lines that have heterozygous variants in, this, in the BPS10 domain. We generated three. I'm going to lump them all together and call, just call them variant cells, along with a haploinsufficient or sort of a heterozygous knockout line that would be more um, similar to uh, a truncating mutation on one allele. And we did some similar experiments. And what we found is that these patient-related variants also show increased A-beta and increased endosome size in a fairly gene-dose-dependent way, if you will, with the knockout cells having the strongest phenotype of both the A-beta and the enlarged endosomes. OK, so I keep coming back to this. Is this, is this a valid therapeutic target? And they will reiterate here that the problem is the size of sorrel one. It's a um, 20, uh, over 2,000 amino acid protein, has multiple distinct domains. And so we thought about how can we um, mimic sort of the, the effects of enhancing sorrel one or the sorrel one pathway without actually trying to figure out how to get, how to get this gene um, effectively in, in cells in a, in a relatively high throughput manner. And so I'm going to go back to you, back to um, the idea of this retromer um, complex that I talked to you about in the beginning as a more global enhancement of trafficking through the endolysosomal network. This is a somewhat accurate um, schematic of the sorrel one retromer complex. It's not quite drawn um, with everything folded correctly, but the take home message is, is retromer is a very large multi-protein complex. Part of this is what we call the cargo recognition core. And one of these uh, proteins called BPS26B binds sorrel one. Okay, so this is how things can get trafficked through the endosomal network. And sorrel one, along with other proteins, directly binds APP. So you can consider this as sort of an adapter protein for how a molecule such as APP would get traffic through the endolysosomal network. And the molecule that I showed you at the beginning that I used in some previous studies has various names. Um, here I'm calling it TPT260. In our previous studies, we called it R33. This is a small molecule. It's a pharmacological chaperone that fits into this pocket of these three um, proteins in the retromer complex. So it's just drawn a little bit differently here. It fits into this pocket and it stabilizes retromer and enhances its function. So this was shown um, quite well about a decade ago. And as I, show, as I showed you in the beginning, if we use this molecule, we can reduce A beta and phospho tau in, in, IP, in wild type and um, cell lines that are from sporadic AD patients but don't have any um, mutations. So we wanted to see if we could rescue the endosome enlargement in our SORL1 um, variant and knockout neurons. So here, what we saw is that if we treated these uh, cells with this retromer drug, TPT260, we could indeed rescue the endosome enlargement that we saw um, in our 
uh, our series of neurons. Interestingly, the uh, full SOR1 knockout, the rescue was not as great as the other cell lines. And importantly, we, we saw no effect in wild type cells. So this suggested to us that, that there's a, a, a limit to how small these vesicles can be. And if they're not overly enlarged, they're not going to get smaller. And we could rescue A beta peptides in every cell line that had at least one functional copy of SORL1. So this A beta was not reduced when um, we had full SORL1 knockout, which makes sense because in order for that retromer pathway to be enhanced, and when we're thinking about APP, APP directly binds to SORL1. So if it's not there, you're not going to have an effect on A beta. But we wanted to look at some of those trafficking um, phenotypes as well. So remember I showed you in the beginning, there were, we have these enlarged endosomes and we could see that certain um, cellular cargo were getting stuck in them. So here we looked at um, one of the retromer subunits, VPS35. And in the black bars are our control conditions where we see that VPS35 is stuck in early endosomes and cells that are, um, heterozygous knockout or fully knocked out for SORL1. However, when we treat with the retromer um, enhancing drug, we can fully rescue this localization. When we look at APP, however, again, I, we could repeat our result that APP was stuck in early endosomes, that it was um, still stuck in early endosomes even in a heterozygous knockout condition. When we treat with our drug, this it requires one functional copy of SORL1 to be rescued to wild type levels. This is not, the mislocalization is not fully rescued in our full knockout. When we looked at our lysosomal um, assays, again, we saw an impairment of this DQ red BSA going to the lysosome in our, our, our uh, vehicle condition, but this was fully rescued when we treated the TPT260. When you look at the other pathway, the recycling. So here are our knockout cells. They are they have an impaired recycling compared to the wild type here in gray and black. And we only see a partial rescue of this um, with TPT treatment and in the knockout cells. But when we have one functional copy of SORL1, we see a full rescue. So just to summarize what I've told you so far is that we can recapitulate this early AD cytopathology, and we can show that both full and partial loss of an AD risk gene, SORL1, contributes to um, dysfunction in, in the lysosomal network. We've established various assays that we can test these cell type specific um, dysfunctions in human cells. And we can show that enhancing endosomal trafficking can rescue these phenotypes. However, this degree of rescue may depend on the endosomal cargo we're looking at and how many functional copies of SORL1 are present. And um, however, though, most because most of this AD risk will come from partial and not full loss of SORL1 expression, we still think this pathway is worth to explore therapeutically. So if I have a few extra minutes, um, I want to just tell you some really um, cool ongoing work that is part of a larger collaboration among several groups here at UW that we're getting really excited about. Because again, I focused on this gene, SORL1. It's, I hope I've convinced you it's certainly important in AD and, and functions in this pathway. But even these partial loss of SORL1 um, the variants that cause partial loss of SORL1 are ex still exceedingly rare. They are not necessarily representative of late onset sporadic AD that is comprising over 95% of AD cases. So in this case, we have no causative gene, we have complex gene environment interactions, and so it's a much larger beast to try to study. But we, here's where we wanted to see if we could consider polygenic risk. So to take a step back, the GWAS studies that have implicated endocytic genes and AD look at populations with sporadic late onset AD. And there's a large signal 
a genetic signal coming from these endocytic loci. So what we've decided to do, and this is um, really spearheaded by Sumi Jayadev in neurology and Liz Blue in medical genetics and uh, with a big collaboration with Dirk Keen's lab here in our department, is try to stratify individuals by looking at their polygenic risk score in the endosomal pathway. So we came up with a list of GWAS um, hits and we have been genotyping samples we get through the neuropath core. And Liz has come up with this polygenic risk score so that we can calculate which individuals have higher risk in this pathway and which individuals have lower risk in this pathway. And the hypothesis is that this may, if we look at this on the cellular level, this may predict certain phenotypes we might see in one group and not another. Okay, so what does our data look like so far? So we first showed that um, individuals with sporadic AD do have a higher, um, generally a higher endosomal polygenic risk. And what Sumi's lab has done, and this is really brand new data, and um, I'm probably not going to do her justice by speaking about it, but I, I'm really excited about what they're finding, is they've taken nine of these AD samples and they've done um, single nuclear RNA sequencing on them. And four of them are high EPRS and five of them are low EPRS. And what we've been able to see so far is that in the high P EPRS, and these are in um, excitatory neuron populations, we have increased expression of endolysosomal genes, and we have enrichment of pathways that you might expect to be impacted by um, aberrant protein trafficking, such as unfolded protein response, protein folding, and um, stress, heat um, stress response. So that's pretty exciting, and we are definitely looking forward to um, uh, continuing and adding to these studies. And what our lab is doing now and has been doing for a while um, is with the neuropath group is generating um, iPSCs from these same patients. And so what was really important to us is that we were generating iPS um, lines from patients that had a true neuropath diagnosis on autopsy of Alzheimer's disease. And so what we do with Dirk's lab is after um, he gets the brain of a patient, he gives us uh, some tissue called the leptomeninges, which is um, a small layer of tissue between the skull and the brain. And we can grow a prime, we can dissociate that and grow a primary cell line from that even several hours um, after the patient has passed with various postmortem intervals. And we have genetic material. So now, uh, our lab currently has 56 primary cell lines generated from leptomeninges. They comprise um, AD patients diagnosed on autopsy or controls, and they comprise about half-half high and low EPRS, and we're in the process of reprogramming these to iPSCs. And so right now we have about 38 um, iPSC lines from these patients. And future work that our lab will be doing is really taking these human brains. So this is a human brain sample um, that we've stained for endosome markers and then taking the matched IPS neuron from these samples and trying to see if based on their genetics, we see morphological differences in the, in the postmortem tissue and endosomes if we can recapitulate in their living neurons, and if we can do functional assays then, like I just showed you, looking at degradation, recycling in these neurons and get some quantitative data. So with that, um, I think I magically stayed on time. I hope I didn't lose anybody by talking too fast, but I would just like to acknowledge my lab um, and for uh, students in the audience, this work was really spearheaded by my first M3D student, Allison, who graduated last year, and Swati Mishra, who is a postdoctoral fellow in our department. Um, I'm just going to again highlight Sumi, Dirk, and Liz for the big uh, collaboration on the EPRS, our funding. And here is the slide um, with the uh, QR code, et cetera. I really appreciate your feedback and evaluation and your attention. Well, thanks, Jessica. I appreciate the really nice update on all the work that you've done for the past six years or so. It's really cool. See how that's progressed. 
Um, I, we should open this up for questions. So uh, please, if anybody has a question, uh, raise your hand and I will call on you. Alex. Hi, Jessica. Great Hi, talk. Alex. Very exciting. Um, I'm definitely overstimulated and stoked uh, and wondering so many different things. Um, so, so yeah, you're, so this retro, this retromer complex is really interesting. So sometimes it just dumps things outside of the cell and sometimes you could get it to dump things into the lysosome if you want to. And are there other ways, are there transcription factors that influence dump it out versus dump it in the lysosome? Like, how do you influence that? Yeah, that's a, a great question. So um, there's not a lot about a known about it uh, transcriptionally. So it just seems to be sort of, it's sort of this ongoing process. Um, and I, I simplified it a lot here. So it there's a lot of other um, proteins and complexes that has to interact with and vesicle support to traffic to the lysosome and the um, re recycling pathway. So, you know, we we are still going through our RNA seq data. It was always we did this RNA seq experiment, and I was a little bit on the fence about it because this there's not known that the transcriptional regulation of how this happens isn't really known. None of these are really transcription factors, but we figured if this process is messed up, maybe we would find a transcriptional signature that would. Um, give us some clues. So we're still looking in that data and we haven't actually done um, an experiment yet where we put these in molecules that enhance the pathway on and done RNA-seq yet. So I don't know that I can really answer your data about the transcriptional or your question about the transcriptional regulation. Cool. Th thanks, Jessica. I might just need to do that experiment. Yeah. Well, when I the thing that came to mind was some of Monica Driscoll's work that and other people in cell culture so when worm cells get older, their neurons will start dumping things out. So like, and it's as if the lysosome, so it seems like the lysosomes are somehow sensing they're gummed up. Yes. So, so the cell. yeah, so there's a process that we're looking at called lysosome exocytosis. So yes, the lysosome does dump stuff out of the cell. And so we're starting to look at that in these um, cells as well. Swati is looking at that. Cool. Very cool. Great talk, Jessica. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Jessica. Uh, great talk. Um, I was interested um, in a lot of the endocytosis assays um, with flu fluorescently labeled uh, proteins, uh, A-beta, transparent, um, and, and albumin. Um, the fluorescence like seemed to kind of not, you know, drop to zero during the chase phase. It yeah. just sort of plateaued yeah, at like 50% or higher. Yeah. So yeah, we're still working on that. Um, it may be a function of how much we're putting in and then how long we're really looking at it after. So yes, it does not drop to zero. Eventually, um, I didn't show this data. So for the transferrin recycling, it eventually does go down to zero because it all goes out of the cell. So, uh, the the um, Substrates that go to the lysosome are interesting, but I believe what other people have shown is that the fluorescence still maintains that, that maybe the degradative enzymes are not chewing up it so much that you don't see, you can still see the fluorescence. fluorescence it's yeah. really an indicator that it's getting to an acidic compartment because it will not be fluorescent if it's not in an acidic compartment. But you're right, it, is, it does have interesting kinetics that we still um, are trying to understand. Uh, is there uh, another question? Right I see the chat, I don't know if I can. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah, go for it, Shane. Yeah, so um, Jessica, one of the things that stuck out to me uh, in a lot of the uh, figures that you presented was that the effect size was always only about 20%. Yeah. Um, there, you know, there are several ways to potentially interpret that. One, one is that we're looking at a system that has to maintain its equilibrium, its um, homeostasis in a very tight range, and you just push it out and it falls out. And that made me wonder whether 
one of the reasons why we find so many mutations associated with AD is that because they're all just kind of pushing that system a little bit out of whack enough to get it a phenotype. That's one interpretation, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, that's a great question. So I've thought about this a lot in a lot of different ways. So let me think about this. So let's think about it first genetically a little bit. Sorrel one knockout mice are fine. They develop a brain, they live to adulthood. And what my interpretation is we're catching an early event that is very subtle at 20% that possibly then over the lifespan of a human, a deficiency of 20% over 80 years is enough to cause disease. So that's one way we've thought about it. Um, we do think that um, there is this tight control. So for example, if you look at components of the retromer complex, BPS35 knockout is not viable. So they're embryonic lethal and we can't actually get cells to survive if we, if we tried to CRISPR and knock it out. Um, when we try to knock down with shRNA or overexpress BPS35, part of the retromer, we get really um, tight autoregulation from the, the endogenous gene, right? So if we try to um, overexpress BPS35, the um, endogenous BPS35 goes down. <laughs> and if we put an shRNA, we're never able to knock it down more than like 20 or 30%, no matter how much we put in. So I do think that there's something about your point of it being very tightly regulated that is correct. And that what we're seeing are what can happen when just a small push um, disrupts this tight regulation. And I will put in there that, you know, it is the case if you have um, some forms of autosomal dominant AD are caused by simply a duplication of APP without um, any, any variance, just an extra copy. So that's again, only a 1.5 um, extra copy of the gene and that's enough to cause early onset AD. So a little bit of a push on the system does seem to be enough to to cause a, a phenotype. A big effect. So it sounds like then that it, it's a nexus point. And that makes me wonder then whether all of those AD associated proteins actually have a high um, uh, protein interaction index. Is that, has that known? <sighs> I don't know. I, I, I just know, you know, so basically, um, I don't know if this is really going to answer your question, but there was a study of, of few years ago that expressed um, AD mutations um, and looked at endosomal uh, phenotypes similar to what we saw, and they see very similar things. So if you put an a, a dominant APP mutation or a dominant presenilin mutation in cells, you also have enlargement of early endosomes and traffic jams. What's interesting is that unlike what we saw, when you put those um, autosomal dominant AD mutations and you can rescue the phenotype by inhibiting APP cleavage. So there's sort of this nexus at the early endosome, but like sort of different consequences when you try to try to treat it. Yeah, yeah, Take thanks. On. But but sorry, let me let me reframe that last question. Uh, I didn't I didn't ask it really clearly. I apologize. If you look at all of the um, proteins that have been pulled out as risk factors for AD. Oh. Okay. and you throw them on a network of proteins and which other proteins they interact with. You get nodes in those um, in that map, but do all of the proteins that come out associated with AD, are they nodes? Are they uh, sort of... Um, uh, yeah, are they the no not Not all of them, no. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah, I agree with you. No, I understand now. No, not all of them are nodes. Because all the, you know, it's hard to know with the GWAS uh, genes that are coming out where the hit really, it, it, that always associates it with the nearest gene. And so there's some, I think where, you know, maybe there's more complex genetic interactions that it may not be that exact gene that's the node. I see, I see. Right. Okay, well, thanks, nice work. Thank you. Are there, uh, are there any other questions? I'm trying to look at the chat. I don't see how yeah. oh, is. No, normally it pops up at the top into my. Okay. Uh, well, I have a, a, a quick question. So you mentioned that there's a, a Sorrel 1 knockout mouse. Um, do, do those show, a, I know you said, 
you know, they live to adulthood and are. are uh, yeah, do those show um, endosomes? Sort of dumbing? <laughs> are, are the endosomes all gummed up and stuff? Yeah, no one's looked so far. So I have collaborators that are looking at that now. And it was always, it was this big uh, comment we got on our paper. They said, oh, this wasn't shown in the knockout mice, but like literally no one has looked. So <laughs> people are looking at that now. And it, but it, what's also interesting about the knockout mice is that they don't have like AD pathology. They have other problems. They have like behavioral issues. Um, and, you know, I think they have like anxiety, uh, some more disorders, but they don't have the, the AD pathology, at least that we've seen. Retromer, my, ret when you knock out or you selectively knock out retromer, I said it's embryonic lethal, but you can do it conditionally. Um, they tend to have more of an AD neurodegeneration like phenotype. All right, uh, last chance. Otherwise we will, uh, I, will, I will say thank you on behalf you. of the audience for giving this talk uh, and an inaugural talk. Uh, and we will see you in uh, two weeks for, for the next uh, research and discovery seminar. And please don't forget to fill out the form. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everybody.